welcome to this event. We're going to talk about um, maximizing efficiency in swine production. Um, my name is Vincent Terbeek. I am editor for the magazine Pig Progress. Uh, we are based in the Netherlands, but we're reporting globally. Dr. Marcus Curley, director of the National Animal Disease Center, USDA ARS, will focus on the influence of the intestinal microbiome in promoting efficient swine production. So today I'm going to commit scientific malpractice. I'm going to talk about a topic that has nothing to do with immunology per se, but I think you'll see some connections and I'll try to give you a, a little bit of a flavor of some of the research that we are doing on this very topic. I've given a subtitle uh, today for Intestinal Microbiota and Metagenomics, Tools to Improve Animal Health and Performance. So I've taken the liberty to uh, adjust a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. And if you've not been past our new facility, this uh, represents the culmination of $470 million of your tax monies uh, invested. And yes, I'm from the government, and I am here to help. <laughs> Believe that, I got a bridge for sale, which Chris can attest to, he's my neighbor. All right, so with that, I'm going to give you just a quick overview of how your tax dollars are invested in our facility, and then finish on how the um, metagenomics work is fitting into some of our research. Um, we do a lot of research on a range of infectious diseases and food safety concerns for the livestock and poultry industries. Uh, many of these are diseases that are eradicated, such as brucella and TB, from our domesticated livestock populations, but they are still present in wildlife. So, yes, we do research on bison. That's not a buffalo, that's a bison, North American bison. Uh, and we put them into the highest level of biocontainment uh, that is possible uh, in the world, BSL3A. We also work with elk and deer, and get two, pretty good reflection off this screen, so sorry for stepping in front. Uh, but we also do research on feral pigs, uh, and uh, all the rest of the livestock and poultry uh, that we normally use for uh, food consumption in this country. So animal protein production is very important. We have another research unit, uh, Eduardo Cassis overseas, on ruminant diseases, basically bovine respiratory disease caused by bacteria or viruses as well as mastitis and other uh, transition dairy cattle disease problems. So they've let them escape the disease of ruminants. And then in swine, we do a, a pretty good amount of research on swine viral diseases. We've been kind of uh, responding to whatever the most recent thing Mother Nature has thrown at us. Uh, we were in the middle of the uh, influenza uh, pandemic virus as well as uh, the porcine circovirus when they emerged, and then most recently with PEDV. Um, Fortunately, when it came to influenza and circovirus, we already had research programs up and running. Uh, when PED emerged, uh, we had canceled our coronavirus research program in 2000. So we really uh, were behind the eight ball in that uh, we didn't have anybody uh, that was uh, skilled in working with coronaviruses. They're tough viruses to grow. Um, some of their cousins include the SARS virus, which has been around for quite a while, and we have no vaccine for SARS in humans. So little wonder we've had some challenges with PED. And then the prion diseases, uh, in Europe they call them prions. The guy who uh, coined the term uh, grew up here in Des Moines, Iowa, and he calls them prions. So there's a constant running battle between the British and Stanley Cruiser and how you pronounce it, so prions. Here's the, uh, the reason we're here today. We have a pre-harvest food safety and enteric disease research unit that used to primarily work on diarrheal diseases in cattle and pigs. Uh, but when E. coli 157 emerged in the 80s, uh, it became a, a big focus to study on food safety. And today we have a re research project that's really focusing on the microbial ecology of the intestinal tract of both pigs and poultry, uh, but also beginning to do some work uh, with the, the ruminants. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is a little bit of that. So some definitions. The intestinal microbiota, what is that? Well, that microbiota is your normal flora. That's what you learn about, you hear uh, people talk about. But it's, a, it's a, in the ecological community of a commensal or mutualistic or pathogenic microorganism. In other words, the full range of bugs that colonize any of our surfaces, the gut, the respiratory tract, the skin, uh, your eye, uh, that's the, the basis for calling something a microbiota. And today we're going to focus on the intestinal. There are over 500 phylotypes, depending on what paper you read, there's as many as over a thousand. What is a phylotype? That is a genetic grouping. So cousins, first cousins, second cousins 
of bacteria. And we'll talk a little bit about how that gets done. Those phylotypes are based on the uh, 16S ribosomal RNA genetic sequence. That's a lot of, this will be on the exam at the end, so I hope you're taking notes. Uh, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene uh, provides a, a protein that's involved with RNA and protein synthesis. So you, you very much need this uh, particular molecule if you're a bacterium to be able to uh, survive. And so there's some conserved genetic structures to it, but we take advantage of the diverse regions, and I'll talk about that. Of the microbiota in your gut, less than 1% of them can be cultivated in a lab and grow in a petri dish or in a broth. We know very little about what's really going on with the microbiome in the intestinal tract or any other surface for that matter. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to talk about today is a tool for us to get a much better handle on that. In our bodies, they estimate that there's 100 trillion individual microbes uh, that is more than 10 times the amount of DNA in the microbes there is actually in our bodies. So you can extend that to a pig because it's, it's a pretty similar digestive tract. And then down here on the bottom of the point, um, so spatial distribution in the intestinal tract varies on what the microbiome is. So what I'm talking about there is from the mouth to the anus, there's differences in the microbiome. And within the, the, the cross section of any one of those points, like if you're talking the duodenum, the, the jejunum, the ileum, the large intestine, and its different segments, from the lining of the mucosa, the mucosal surface, into the center of the lumen, it varies. So it's a very complex and dynamic environment. What is metagenomics? This is a new tool that's been enabled by the dramatic drop in sequencing costs. I'm sure here at the Pont Pioneer, you're doing a lot of genetic sequencing of, of your germplasm. Uh, but the, the tremendous revolution in the DNA sequencing world has allowed us to begin doing some of this research for the first time that we could not previously afford to do. So, you know, you can, you can sequence a genome today for a few hundred dollars. Uh, the first human one was several billion dollars. Uh, it took almost uh, 15 or 16 years to get done. So today we can do things much more quickly. Our facility we have a sequencing capacity to do three to five human genomes a week. We don't have money to do that many, but that, the, the capacity is there. So we can now begin to ask questions about the microbiome and the organisms, the animals that, that we're studying uh, that we could never ask before. So we have faster, cheaper sequencing. We can do it directly from the natural habitat. So we don't have to cultivate the organism. That's the value of the metagenomics. As I told, just told you, 99% of them we can't grow in the lab. We can take the intestinal contents and extract the DNA from that and sequence it. And then throw it into a supercomputer, wait a few weeks, and get some results back. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some immunology. Some of this I was actually involved with uh, back in the early 90s. And it, it, it asked a lot of, caused me to ask a lot of questions around what is it that in feed antibiotics are doing in animals. I grew up on a farm. We raised dogs 70 to 90 sows, fair to finish twice a year. We milked dairy cows 20 to 40 head. We had sheep. We had the old fashioned farm. And we used all the tools we could to, to you know, make, make a profit. But one of the things that's never been clear in my mind is how do in feed antibiotics actually work? You'd think with all the great researchers in the world, if there was a mechanism of action where the epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract was triggered in some way by ASP250 to be more efficient at transporting some nutrient, we'd know about it by now, but we don't. In 1945, the first germ-free rodent, which was a rat, was created and 70 years ago, and people began to understand aspects of health and the microbiome in the gut because germ-free animals don't have a microbiome anywhere on their body. And they began to give some understanding that there are tremendous impacts of the microbiome on the development of the intestinal cells, the epithelial cells that make up our lining of the gut. Tremendous impact of the microbiome on the immune system of virtually every animal species that we've ever studied. Pathogen displacement. Some of the first work was based on use of germ-free animals. Nutrient digestion. You put an animal, and I, I put a calf in a germ-free bubble. It grows extremely well. 
is not competing with pathogens or normal flora for any of its nutrients. Now, yes, we were feeding it a very artificial diet, but they do grow extremely well. And then a lot of indications around nutrient digestion and, and vitamin synthesis in the, in the lower uh, GI tract. There's a, a lot of good things that have come out of these germ-free animal studies. We also call them notobiotic animals. The immune system, when an animal is first born, is immature. They don't have any antibodies against anything that mother didn't give them. And it, the immune system will continue to mature right up to about the point of puberty. <clears throat> I'm reaching that age in life where my immune system is going to begin to senesce and go the other direction. But we won't focus on that today. The germ-free animals were first reported that the immune system of uh, what they, at the, in the papers that were published in the 50s and 40s, the part of the immune system that sees the external world was very underdeveloped in these germ-free animals. And so the cells that make antibodies, you go and get a vaccine, uh, you, you know, produce an immune response. The lymphocytes that are involved in doing that, that are producing your uh, immunity with a vaccine, they are not populating those tissues very much because they're not needed. There's no pathogens there, there are no commensal organisms, no mutualistic organisms. So we began to understand that the immune system is not needed. And I want you to think about that because I'm going to show you some numbers that we calculated uh, a few years back on the cost of the immune system from a nutrient point of view. So the, the lymphoid development, which is what we call your adaptive immunity, you get antibody antigen specific responses to the vaccine, but also the innate immune system. The innate immune system is that which acts very quickly, minutes to hours. It, it doesn't have any immune memory, so it's not like a vaccine. But if you think of a pimple, that's your innate immune system at work, plus forming cells. So I had a calf that I put in a germ-free bubble, and this is some of the data from that calf. And one of the things that happened was when an animal is born, you have so many white blood cells, all right? And when this calf was being monitored in the, in the germ-free environment, we noticed very quickly that it quit making one of the most important innate immune cells called the neutrophil, and for no apparent reason, it really didn't need them. Well, the apparent reason would actually be there's no normal flora in the gut. If an animal was to be in a conventionally raised environment, that neutrophil count would remain up here around five to 6,000 per microliter of blood. That may not seem real dramatic, but the absence of that intestinal flora reduced the need for that animal to produce neutrophils. And that's been reported in just about every germ-free animal that ever has been studied, including pig. So is this one of the mechanisms by which in-feed antibiotics work? And can we flip that around and have an understanding of how the innate immune system works and actually improve feed performance, growth? We don't know. But that, that is a, a, a legitimate question that uh, we, can, we can learn from some of these germ-free studies. So what are the, the caloric and protein demands of the immune system? There has been a lot of research done in this area, but not a whole lot in some of the livestock species we work with. If, you, if the body's making neutrophils that, uh, that have a circulating half-life of six to nine hours, uh, that means that in, a, in an adult dairy cow, which these numbers are based on, there's about 300 trillion of them made every single day. That's a significant amount of body mass. Uh, you can divide that down for a sow by some factor, however heavy you want your sows to be. It's pretty much proportional to body weight. There's a lot of activities that the immune system spends energy and protein and other nutrients to carry out its task. And uh, all of that requires nutrients. In fact, a lot of the products will raise the basal metabolic rate. If you run a fever, which a lot of the components of the immune system trigger to fight infections. Uh, if you've ever had any uh, uh, physiology training, you know that chip body temperature is an exponent in the, in the formula to calculate the basal metabolic rate. So a one or two degree fever has a significant impact on nutrient consumption and energy and protein usage. In fact, in cancer patients who are struggling uh, against cancer, tumor necrosis factor uh, is a, a very important cytokine that, that contributes to the breakdown of protein from your muscles to be used as energy sources. So the immune system can have a very strong, what we call, cachectic effect or, or loss of body mass uh, in many different ways. <coughs> in fact, there's been some studies done in humans 
uh, where people suffering severe infections, uh, such as uh, septic uh, diseases, that their energy expenditure will increase over a week. Uh, and over a three week period, they can lose up to 13% of their body protein. That's not a minor number. We did some calculations on what the cost of uh, just maintenance energy requirements are for an adult dairy cow. And if we increase the energy expenditure 40%, which is not uncommon with an inflammatory response, uh, we would have to increase the uh, energy requirements by four megacals per day. Now that, that will add up on a dairy cow, a colleague of mine, Jesse Goff, uh, 2.4 kilograms of diet would have to be added uh, to just maintain that cow. So what is the cost of a low-grade fever running through a livestock pen? If you've got a pen of hogs and you've got a fever, it's going to cost you some money. And it's, it's going to cost it in the form of the feed. Now some people have shown that there are compensatory gains after a disease episode. But uh, have we really actually captured the true cost of those disease events beyond the mortality events, uh, which uh, certainly costs a lot of money themselves? How do we estimate this and what are these, you know, if these costs are real, how would you value a product that reduces this risk? So, on to the focus of some of our work today. We have a national strategy today for combating antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And this is not just unique to the United States. Uh, this is a global effort to try to reduce the use uh, of in-feed antibiotics. This is a very big economic impact because the economic engine of, of U.S. agriculture is quite substantial. In 2012, uh, the gross domestic product of U.S. agriculture was just under $400 billion for the year. Obviously, that was a year where uh, the price of grain was pretty good, largely supported by the ethanol industry. But it was one of those years where crops actually exceeded the uh, gross domestic product of livestock and poultry production. Typically, they run neck and neck. We have very few funding resources for research in the United States. And so much of what we're trying to do is focus our research dollars on the diseases that have the biggest impact. So one of our strategies today in the United States is to try to find alternatives to antibiotics if we're going to lose all these in-feed antibiotics and to target those diseases where antibiotics are used most heavily. So that pretty much captures what we've got here, respiratory disease, enteric disease, reproductive disease, and mastitis and dairy cattle. And then the other piece of this, which is extremely important and I mentioned earlier, what, what about stressed animals? They have a very high incidence of, of disease and that will, uh, the stress will predispose to disease. How can we manage the microbiome of a stressed animal and be more efficient in what we do? So the in feed antibiotics is probably a political loss that we've already had to fight and really didn't have a good chance of surviving. But they're, they're, the pressure of antibiotic use is very real and uh, it's most likely going to go, uh, they're going to go away as a tool for us, except for therapeutic use. Are there immune modulators that can be used as alternatives is one of our big areas of research. And if we can modulate the microbiota, the microbiome and the guts of animals, we might be able to have a significant impact on immune development as well as the actual occurrence of disease. So these are some of the questions that we're currently trying to study through the use of metagenomics. How is the microbiota affected by stress? Uh, one of the questions earlier today asked the question about sow performance and heat stress in the summer. We actually have been working on some models to study the impact of heat stress on the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome. What changes are occurring and then can we counter those changes to, to maintain performance? Can we manage these uh, microbiomes through various tools and, and, and additives that, that are, might be available from other parts of the agricultural community? And any other question, do some of our production practices impact these microbiomes? You know, one of the things that I hear from veterinarians is these uh, long silage bags that are being used to store U.S. Uh, number two yellow corn that's going into the uh, ethanol industry. One of the outputs of that is dried distiller grains. Well, the veterinarians refer to those long tubes of corn that's not been dried properly as fumonisin generators. So. Uh, I think we have, have some legitimate questions to ask about how we're handling corn. Yeah, it's going into ethanol production, but there's a byproduct that may be contaminated with various mycotoxins that 
is, is escaping our detection and, and perhaps some of our logical thinking around that. Okay. Another thing is, what happens over the course of an animal's life? We have a lot of dietary changes, but there's production things that happen. Those animals get moved, transported. How do those events impact the microbiome? Are there things that we can do with those animals prior to such changes in transport or other stressful events uh, that will minimize the effect of that stress on their health? And there's tons of things that are out there, probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotic, you name it. We're interested in trying to get some very good science applied to these uh, products and materials and, and make some science-based decisions of what are going to be the best approaches uh, to, to manage the health of, of the gut microbiota. And they obviously promote health and prevent disease. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of some research that we've done recently and uh, just kind of let you digest, if you will, no pun intended, uh, some of what we found and, and see where we are, are trying to go with our research. So, as I mentioned before, there's over 500 uh, species in the mammalian gut, uh, and we don't understand uh, a lot of them, uh, and we certainly uh, can't sequence all of them. And we know that various uh, health and disease states will change the balance of what's going on there. Uh, Tori Luft is one of the scientists in our project, and he recently published a paper uh, which basically showed that if you think you're going to understand the intestinal microbiota by measuring what is in the feces, you're going to miss it. Because what's in the feces is after the animal, but it, it does not represent everything that was there from the mouth to the anus. Uh, Dr. Heather Allen is another scientist. She was the person that you would have preferred to have speaking here today, but she's at the American Society of Microbiologists meeting along with her colleague, Tori. Uh, but she's done a lot of the, the software and, and analysis of the data that I'm going to show you and uh, developed some nice tools as internal uh, quality control tools, I should say, uh, for analyzing this massive amount of genomic data because they get terabytes of data from a single experiment that can take a long time even on a supercomputer if we're borrowing one from uh, certain establishments within the federal government. So what they focus on, as I mentioned earlier, is the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene. That is a gene that's unique, but it's universal across all bacteria. We don't have one except in our bacteria in our bodies. So they target that particular sequence. It has some very constant regions, like I said, that were conserved to carry out its function. But the different bacterial species have evolved separately and there's regions that are variable. So we can actually sequence those variable regions to figure out what genetic relatedness some of these bacteria have and then make comparisons of those phylotypes across the different treatments that we do in our animals. And uh, there's a couple variable regions at this particular end of the sequence that they've been focusing on. They use PCR to amplify those segments and then uh, use these uh, high throughput sequencers to generate the data. The other thing that's uh, pretty slick is we do have some robotics. Uh, we're not equipped like a pioneer might be, but uh, we do use uh, robotics that will help us. And for us, it's considered high throughput. Uh, but having worked in the pharmaceutical industry, um, it's not quite high throughput, but it really does help us uh, address uh, these large amounts of samples that get generated and the, the uh, volumes of data. So one of the things that we needed to make sure that we were doing right, because there's not been a lot of research in this area, but our scientists decided that they wanted to make sure that they could detect what they put into the animal as a positive control. And so they developed a mock microbial community of known organisms that will colonize a pig. And they wanted to do that to test their error rate of their genetic analysis of the uh, DNA that they were getting out of the out of the various components of the gastrointestinal tract that they were sampling. And this is just the uh, list of those 20 organisms and uh, there are things that you, many of you would recognize as, as pathogens, uh, but there's also some organisms in there that only a true microbiologist who uh, loves bacteria would ever have heard of before. So they began to apply that tool then to study various effects of what we're going to call disturbances of the microbiota, <laughs> such as use of in feed antibiotics. So we've got some examples of ASP250 usage, carbidox, but we also have some uh, studies where we've looked at a salmonella challenge, 
and how those things impact the gut microbiota. The goal here is we always have control animals that are receive a normal diet or uh, normal conditions uh, and then compare it to those that we disturb. So we want to understand what normal is in the gut microbiome because anything that gets changed by in-feed antibiotic usage or a disease event then would be abnormal. And if we can find ways to maintain normal, if we uh, need that to maintain health through different product usage, then it gives us a, the ability to test different compounds to see what might be able to replace in feed antibiotic usage. So there's a lot of things that we could look at. We, we are obviously trying to work on more efficacious vaccines to control pathogens. Uh, but people are also looking at phage therapy, phage are viruses that attack bacteria. Uh, can you wipe out the pathogen through the use of a virus that attacks only bacteria? Bacteriocins are proteins that are produced by bacteria that help one bacterium compete in that microbiome against its neighbor. And then there's also a, a group of people looking at predatory bacteria that will actually attack uh, neighboring bacteria. And the goal would be to find predatory bacteria that are not harmful, but they would get rid of harmful bugs. So the whole goal here is try to modulate what the gut microbiota looks like, how it functions in the host, and can we uh, use that to the advantage of the pig. So one study was the use of ASP250. Uh, you guys know how that's used, I'm sure. Uh, that you took a group of pigs that are about three months of age, small studies. We're generating large sequence data sets. So instead of 500 pigs per group, which we'd love to be able to do, uh, we're doing six pigs per treatment group. And then they conducted paired necropsies after the animals were on ASP250 over a period of 16 days to monitor what changed and did anything come back to normal. So one of the things, and this, this is a, uh, a cross-section of a wide range of bacterial organisms on the right-hand side here. Um, and then the first bar is animals that, in the ileum, and then the ileum mucosa. So they, they did these necropsies, they identified the ileum, which is part of the small intestinal tract. They tied off the ends, take it back to the lab very quickly after they held it on ice and then uh, they sampled the lumen contents, but then they washed off the mucosa and then scraped the mucosa to get the organisms that were actually attached to the mucosal lining of the ileum. And I'm just using this one example. So on ASP250, one of the things that they found, uh, this is the uh, ileum content. Without ASP250 and with ASP250, the ileum mucosa without it, and then the far right bar is the ileum mucosa uh, with ASP250. And you can see that yellow population it actually represents the expansion of E. coli organisms uh, in both the uh, ileal contents as well as on the ileal mucosa. Interestingly, none of the E. coli, they did sequence a large sampling of those E. coli, none of them were pathogenic E. coli. So that's pretty good news. But that's the, those yellow areas. So. ASP250 had a distinct impact on changing some of the gut microbiota. Well, other aspects of what they found there was that there was considerable bacterial diversity from the ileum to the large intestine, and as well as they found some differences in the, the lumen contents. So this is all new areas that there's really not been very much published research in. So these guys are, no pun intended, pioneering this area. Um, but if you want to laugh at it, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, one of the things here was that ASP250 had different effects depending on where <coughs> we're looking at in the intestinal tract. Some of the changes were universal across the gut, but others were very specific to uh, a given location. So it's going to be a very complex uh, story before we understand all of it. I think it's very important to appreciate that because if you're looking at feces coming out at the end, and you know that there's going to be very specific differences depending on where you're at in the gastrointestinal tract, that feces sample is not going to really tell you a whole lot. And it's not going to represent what may be going on at different segments of the gastrointestinal tract. The other study that uh, they took a look at was with Carbidox. Uh, you guys know what it's used for. Um, it, it has uh, no analog in human medicine. So we are not sure exactly what the FDA is going to do to us with that one, uh, but it's not currently a, an antibiotic that's important for human use. 
It is, however, banned in many countries because it has mutagenic uh, properties. So one of the things that they found was that carbon dioxide pigs caused a temporary decrease in the diversity of the bacteria in the microbiome. And uh, I found that rather intriguing and rather encouraging that you could take a powerful antimicrobial such as carbon dioxide feed it to a pig, it has its temporary and desired effect against the pathogens you're trying to control, and then things begin to return to normal. And so, given that there is a, a withdrawal period prior to slaughter, everything should be back to normal at that point in time. So, from that, we, I think, need to understand and appreciate that not all disturbances, stress, uh, <clears throat> in feed antibiotics or products, we haven't looked at a lot of these other kind of feed additives yet. Uh, but we have every intention to do that. Uh, we have looked at some, but it's not published work, so what, what I've been sharing with you today is, is published data. The uh, one study with salmonella uh, was rather profound in that the microbiome of pigs challenged with salmonella never recovered back to what it was before in the healthy pigs. So a pathogen appears to be quite capable of causing a rather severe disturbance. In our heat stress model, uh, one of the things that they're finding is, is that uh, obviously there's effects on the microbiome, but there's also effects on the architecture, the, the tissue structure uh, of the intestinal tract and blunting of the villi. So it's, it's not too surprising to me that under heat stress that animals are not going to perform as well uh, if the absorptive villi have, have been blunted. So I guess the, uh, the summary for today is we do not as of yet have a magic bullet alternative to in-feed antibiotic usage. And uh, right now at this point, it's still a, a pipe dream to try to get something that will uh, replace them that has an impact on the microbiota, but that doesn't mean we should give up on, on trying to find some. Our future research is going to focus on various disturbances um, and how they may affect the microbiota under various uh, production environments. We think that by studying uh, the, met the metagenomic approach, uh, we're going to get a, a real good understanding of what's going on. But to extend that, we're also going to be looking at gene expression in the intestinal contents of the uh, bacteria that are there to see what it is that they're producing, what genes are they turning on uh, as part of that microbial world that they live in. Because some of that is very important. We did see in some of our studies that butyrate production um, is very important for energy in the gastrointestinal tract. And some of the microbiota that uh, were increased under certain feed conditions with some of the in-feed antibiotics, the butyrate producers actually went up. So that, that may be an important thing uh, when it comes to finding alternatives. If we can find ways to modulate that microbiota that mimics that aspect of, of performance, it, it may be a good thing to know that. So with that, I too will finish early, and uh, I like using this particular slide, the National Animal Disease Center, uh, while we are located in Ames, Iowa, and Ames, Iowa, of course, is in mourning today with the loss of our basketball coach, uh, but we have no state boundaries for the diseases and, and the animal health issues uh, that we conduct research on, and we are indeed your federal tax dollars at work. So with that, I will attempt to answer any questions that you have. Yes. know is that uh, the time it takes for a weaned animal to start consuming feed has a large impact on the probability of survival. Uh, it would be interesting to understand microbial impacts of delayed feed intake uh, and you know understand how that how those things combine to impact absolutely survival. No, weaning stress is huge and uh, a lot of dietary change, uh, being taken away from mom. There's a lot of very uh, good questions to be asked there and understand how will we do that. Um, the, uh, there's actually research on uh, in the human world on how long should we breastfeed and how, what impact does that have on the intestinal microbiota. So there's, there's a lot of things going on there that, um, that there's a whole world of opportunities ahead of us as we begin to get a better handle on these tools and how to apply them and understanding what's going on. But I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, not sure that 
you know, it's, it's pretty tough to feed pigs for a short time period and segregated early weaning had its role, but that's a very tough uh, critter to get back up and, and marching when it comes to feed intake, I'm sure. Yes? Would you want to bring us up to date on the turkey virus? Oh, the high path avian influenza? So, uh, high path avian influenza virus that's uh, currently uh, found a home in the flyways over the central Midwest began in the West Coast last year. Uh, it is a virus that uh, seems to do nothing to the migratory waterfowl that it colonizes and it's a real biosecurity challenge uh, for our poultry producers, turkeys and chickens and other gallinaceous birds. Our facility, um, we do not do the, the primary infectious disease research with avian influenza virus. That's done at the Southeast Poultry Lab in Athens, Georgia, <coughs> some colleagues of ours uh, that are USDA Agricultural Research Service. Their primary focus is on that. Uh, that said, however, uh, at the request of the pork producers, we have already put that virus in pigs. Our last necropsies of uh, contact pigs uh, were con concluded, I believe, yesterday. Um, so we have some data to get analyzed to find out, one, does it infect and transmit in pigs? Uh, we have previously looked at other high path avian influenza viruses in pigs uh, and uh, came to the determination that those viruses do not tend to replicate well in pigs nor transmit well in pigs. It's good news for the pork producers, but it's obviously a real challenge for the poultry producers. Um, I think we've lived through a two and a, two and a half year period now almost of understanding how important biosecurity is. And I, I, I struggle, and I think about this at night, how, how can we take some of the practices that we have at a high biocontainment research institute and put them to practical use? You know, can, can you really manage what's on the bottom of your shoes walking on a farm because of something that flew over? Or, you know, we have, we've seen influenza viruses show up in pigs several years ago through the use of uh, pond surface water to clean the pens or even provide water for those pigs. It was a transient infection of an H2N3 virus. It eventually uh, petered out and didn't um, sustain transmission in pigs. Uh, it was down in Missouri. And so there's, there's a lot of things that we need to better understand what our true weak points are in biosecurity. And of course, the epidemic diarrhea virus clearly demonstrated that um, we had some gaps. And uh, as you know, there's 600,000 to a million pigs on wheels every 24 hours in this country. And that makes it very difficult to manage. Uh, and yet, we don't see quite that animal movement, I don't believe, in the poultry industry uh, from one point of another for production. But they too have, have very severe problems now because we, we've been able to avoid that disease in large part because it wasn't in our migratory waterfowl. Well, they're here now. And the scientists at Southeast Poultry Lab suggest that based on previous experience in other regions of the world, uh, that those viruses will likely remain in those migratory waterfowl for three to five years. So that's, that's going to be a real serious challenge. And, and it's, a, it's a tough thing uh, for, for those producers, just like when PED swept through uh, swine herds. Uh, I'm sure that it's not a good day when you wake up and you see you got birds dying. Clarification between PED and this turkey is to a foreign animal disease. The reason I ask that the turkey producers are getting paid for the live birds, they got, but the PED people did not. Right. They both came from foreign countries. So um, that's more of a policy question. I'm paid to do research. Uh, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Uh, but uh, there's a different body within USDA that uh, would be the ones that would need to address that. There must that. be some definition that I have personally. Yeah, yeah, and me too. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a very fine line, but uh, it, it, it's a very good question that there are other people you should ask that question of. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I do have a question. Sure. <clears throat> Is there any um, research being done to African swine fever uh, virus? As you know, uh, mostly in Russia and Eastern Europe at the moment. 
Um, is there any research being done? So the, the question is about African swine fever virus research. Uh, what is being done is being done through the Plum Island uh, facility. Uh, there's a small team of researchers there. Uh, they're moving someday to Manhattan, Kansas, to the new MBAP facility. They are conducting some research on African swine fever, but um, we are we're not close to having an efficacious vaccine at this time. And you know, some people feel that one of the best ways to combat these diseases is targeting them in the countries in which they're currently endemic. And uh, that is not a bad approach if you can stamp them out there. You know, there's only been two viruses that have been eradicated from their hosts in, in the world. And the first one was smallpox, and the second one was rinderpest. Uh, both of them were diseases that had very obvious clinical symptoms in their hosts. Um, some of us in this room were old enough to be vaccinated against smallpox using vaccinia. The uh, rinderpest was, a, I think, an even more monumental achievement because it had several animal hosts and, and, and you know was endemic in, in continents where there's not good control over all of the animals that are hosts, but they had good uh, diagnostics, they had good vaccines, it was modified live virus vaccines, they gave good protective immunity, and we were able to actually eradicate those. Are we gonna do that with every pathogen that we encounter? You know, ASF would be one that would be nice to be able to do that with. I think that there's no question of that because it has a, a, a unique lifestyle and that it can be uh, spread by ticks, so. That's a real challenge if it gets into your environment. Yes? Same, same kind of general question on foot and mouth disease. You know, where they're at on developing vaccine for that? Or? So the question is on foot and mouth disease, uh, what, where we're at on vaccines. There are a lot of vaccines already approved for use around the world in endemic countries. The problem is, and I don't know the total number of serotypes, there's a large number of variants of the FMD virus. And so that means it's kind of like the vaccine for the common cold. This range might be bigger than what you can carry. That said, um, there are uh, some vaccines that our colleagues at Plum Island have been working on uh, that are DIVA, meaning they can vaccinate and tell if the animal's been vaccinated and has an immune response to the vaccine versus if it saw the wild type virus. That's very important. Uh, one of the vaccines that they ha already have approved and uh, it is available for use in the United States if it's deemed that we need to use one in the event of an outbreak, and that's through the use of a replication defective uh, adenovirus. Uh, adenoviruses are one of the viruses that cause colds in humans, and this is actually a, a replication defective human adenovirus where they've put in um, key genes from the foot and mouth disease virus, so it has that DEVA capability, and it, it is protected. Uh, and it is available if it needs to be used. I think there's, again, some policy questions uh, that the United States is going to have to face on how would we manage a foot and mouth disease outbreak. And there's a lot of discussion about vaccinating to live in a ring concept uh, to manage it. And I know the pork producers have been uh, very proactive in, in developing plans around this with the idea that it might be better to do that uh, than to completely depopulate. You know, we're currently living through some challenges with depopulation you know, with the poultry industry. So um, I think we can all imagine what that would be like if it was FMD. So uh, there are vaccines available. Uh, Plum Island also has some other vaccines uh, that they have developed, uh, which they are highly encouraged by that may provide more cross protection uh, than the adenovirus vectors one will. And, and so there's, there's still continued research investment into those. Uh, to try to make sure that if in the event that those get into this country um, that, that we have a, an ability to respond without having too much devastation on our economy. As you know, more animals die in an FMD outbreak from the eradication than the actual disease. So with that though, sorry, just comment on that then. So if you're going to circle vaccine, does that mean you're going to basically capture all the deer and try to vaccinate them as well? That, that's a huge challenge just the wildlife. Yeah. But, you know, deer are a big challenge with other diseases, too. You know, we got white-tailed deer in, in the northeast corner of Michigan that are endemically infected with tuberculosis. We've got white-tailed deer and other ruminants in this country that are all uh, infected with bovine viral diarrhea virus. And if you're a cattle producer and cow-calf operation out on a range and they're exposed to deer, the deer become persistently infected just like cattle will and shed huge volumes of the virus. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of 
a lot of challenges that we face with the wildlife species. And certainly feral swine are a huge challenge, particularly in the context of ASF. In the processing packing houses, uh, post harvest carcasses, what's been done to help improve those carcasses from uh, the reduction of safety coli and recovery? Mean, what's, what's common today and what's needed in the future? So the question, if I understand it, is what are we doing with carcasses to reduce um, contamination of foodborne pathogens? Funny you should mention that. Um, so I have uh, two former colleagues that are no, now both retired from NADC. Several years ago developed a, uh, a device that was um, able to detect very small quantities of fecal contamination on a carcass in the slaughterhouse. And it was based on reflected fluorescence of chlorophyll pigments that are in the feed that would be in the feces. So if you nicked an intestine, contaminated a carcass, it would show up on that carcass. And that device has actually been licensed. Um, one of the uh, <coughs> slaughterhouse companies uh, put it in all of their plants for a period of time, uh, but it was never mandated by law to be used. The other thing that can be done, as you know, with things like E. coli 157 and a lot of these pathogens, uh, foodborne pathogens, the problem is with processed meats. Uh, not, you know, I don't think there's been an E. coli 157 outbreak from a prime rib, ribeye, or a T-bone. Uh, so irradiation is a well-proven technique that's used on a lot of the foods that we get at the grocery store today, but there's a perception concern that it's not going to be accepted. How is it that we can use it on fruits and vegetables and the public has accepted it, but we think it won't be on the other. So uh, those again are some policy questions. Uh, do we need to mandate those? You know, they, they are tools that are out there. Um, most of mo what we're trying to do at our center is pre-harvest food safety. And I think that's a huge bar to get over. Because if you, if, if you produce a vaccine to reduce colonization by E. coli 157, but it's not used in 100% of the animals, and even if you only reduce colonization by, let's say, 10,000 times, it's still potentially there. So are you reducing the probability of an advert, you know, something happening 10,000 times? Well, perhaps, but um, there, there's a lot of tools that we need to put to that, that um, science has delivered some tools, but we don't have the policies in place uh, that have mandated them. So to me, that's the biggest hurdle is to make that happen, but I don't set policy.